Thanks, worship team. Uh, Brandon, I don't know, Brandon, I don't know if you uh, picked those songs yourselves, or Megan, if that was you, but those were perfect songs uh, for this passage, so thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. It is so good to be here. Uh, I was one of those who missed last week, but not because of the snow. I was sick, but, um, but it's always good to be with you. Uh, Before we get started, I want to add one more announcement to uh, the mix of things that you already heard that I really do hope that you get a chance to participate in some of the things that we're doing here as a church. But I wanted to let you know that for the first time in quite a long time that we as a church are planning a missions trip uh, to go and serve alongside with one of our missionaries. So... A lot of you know that Brent Howland is a missionary who used to be an elder here at this church, but he serves with international messengers, uh, and basically he is a pastor to a bunch of missionaries around the world. Um, And we get a chance, and we're planning on this trip to go with him, uh, and Colin, probably I think your dad might be there too, but but go there and be with him uh, to, to basically share the gospel with some people. And you might notice I don't have a location on there, and it's not because we're not going to tell you. Uh, it's partly because it's just we're, we're going to air this over the internet, and uh, we don't want to promote it that way. But I'll tell you this, I'd be in denial if I wasn't able to tell you exactly where it was. Because when we asked if we could go on this trip with Brent, I said, like Moses, let my people go on this trip. So we are planning this, like it says up there, July 29th through August 6th. We are hoping to have 10 to 12 of us to go over there. And we're going to be hosting an English camp uh, to uh, help share the gospel. And we can give you a lot more details with that. Um, And we would really like you to prayerfully consider uh, being a part of that with us. Uh, You don't have to have any set of skills. Um, you know, English doesn't even have to be your first language. Um, just have to be able to want to have a conversation with some people. So you would get all the training you need uh, if you go on this with it. And I'll just say this is sort of one more clue. that If you don't even pray and consider going on this, there's a possibility that 10 plagues might fall on you. So... So those are all the hints that you have. But there's more information coming. Um, If you really want to find out more, you can talk to myself. uh, You can talk to the Jobsons. You can talk to the Dowds. um, uh, And we'd love to tell you a little bit more about that. So, um, yeah. Well, if you have your Bibles, uh, please open it to Romans chapter 6. As we get into this, this is going to be... In my opinion, this is one of the most exciting chapters of the Bible, uh, and it's also one of the most difficult chapters of the Bible, Uh, not just in a sense to understand it, but really difficult in terms of living it out. Um, But before we even get into this passage, you know, obviously the way that we've been doing this series uh, is the other pastors and I have been studying this together. and because of that, we just thought it'd be fun to each of us to have a turn. So we've been rotating in how we do this rather than having one do several weeks in a row, which, frankly, we don't know if you like that or not, but we're, we're enjoying that. Um, but obviously, if we're going to be doing that, it's, all, it's helpful, I think, for us to kind of bring you up to speed where we are, both so that you know where we are in the passage, uh, but to also let you know that we're on the same page as pastors, that we're, we're still all trying to get to the same place, even though we do things in different ways and we uh, communicate things in different styles. But as you've already heard, the book of Romans is basically broken up into three parts. It's God's righteousness, and the first part is that it's God's righteousness explained. That's the first eight chapters, and we're in the middle of that right now. In Romans 6. Then you got God's righteousness defended, and that's Romans 9, 10, and 11. 
and then God's righteousness applied. Uh, and that's 12 through the end of the book. Um, and, and God's righteousness explained those first four chapters, it's really, it's demonstrated that God's righteousness comes through Christ alone by faith. Uh, and that's for everyone. And then where we are right now in chapter 6, so chapters 5, 6, 7, and 8, is that promised life that God uh, gives to those who come by faith uh, in Christ through the Holy Spirit. Um, and chapter 5, as we talked about the last couple weeks, that's the life of peace. Today is the sanctified life. Um, and then 7 is life of freedom. And chapter 8 is life in the Spirit. Um, but really, it's the new life that we have that we get by grace, by trusting with our faith in Jesus Christ. Um, and so, and how do we live out this life? And so today's sermon title is The Sanctified Life. Um, and really, what does it mean for us to have new life? What does that look like? Um, and one of those big overarching themes here in chapter 6 is this idea of freedom. This idea that we've been emancipated. Um, of course, it doesn't quite use the term emancipated, but there's that freedom um, that in Jesus, you and I have been set free. And as we start here in chapter 6, uh, Paul really is continuing that conversation that he's been having in the previous section, talking about God's gift. Paul calls it, calls it in verse 17 uh, of chapter 5, God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness. Then specifically in chapter 5, verse 20, it says, where sin increased, grace increased all the more. Meaning, as a person's awareness or understanding increased about how much they have sinned, so does the reality of grace increase. Now, you might think of yourself as saintly as Mother Teresa, who wasn't perfect, but could admit her faults and could confess her sin, and grace would be enough. Or you could come to the realization that you're as wicked as Adolf Hitler, Jeffrey Dahmer, Harvey Weinstein, and Jeffrey Epstein all wrapped up in one. And if you were to come to Jesus, God's grace is enough. God's grace increases, so to speak, to cover even the most vile of sinners. And that's enough for you and for me. And that's the thing about this gospel, about this good news of Jesus Christ, that God's grace isn't something that can be earned. It doesn't matter how good you are. It doesn't matter how bad you've been. That we are saved by faith alone. We are saved by placing our, our trust in Jesus. And he gives grace freely and abundantly. So, of course, that might lead somebody to draw the wrong conclusion about grace. You know, a person could say, well, if salvation is by faith alone, then there's really no need for me to obey Jesus. There's no need for me to try and be better because if God's grace is there, I can do what I want. And if you were to think that, ask that question, you're right where Paul wants you to be, because Paul anticipates that question here in chapter 6. Um, so, as we get ready uh, to look into chapter 6, can you pray with me? And then we'll jump into the passage. Our great God and Heavenly Father, I thank you that, that you have given us Jesus. There's not a single person here who is here because we 
are deserving or because we're worth it or because we're good enough or because you love us more than anyone else because of something we've done. That we're all here because of Jesus. We all need Jesus. And that you give us your grace abundantly. And as we look into to this passage, we look into this word, and that I'm completely humbled by the truths of it. But how undeserving I am. And how often I fail to live up to it. Yet your grace is there. And so as we dive in, God, reveal yourself to us. May your spirit penetrate our spirit to remove guilt and shame and burdens and, and, and attempts that free us up to live the life that you intended for us. So where my words fall short, God, may your spirit continue to work to communicate the truths that are of you. So we pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So as I said, Paul anticipates this, this question, this idea of why should I live a, a particular way? So why don't you follow along with me as I read some of this. Um, um, yeah, so Romans chapter or 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? By no means. Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? It's a great question. You might not have heard it that way, or you might not have said it yourself but you have probably heard that question. It might have sounded this way. If all I have to do is believe in Jesus, why can't I live the way that I want? After all, if I sin more, God will show me more grace, right? Or it may sound like this. I'll live my life now. I'll eat, I'll drink, I'll be merry, I'll do what I want. And then when I'm dying... I'm on my deathbed, I'll, I'll, I'll do a deathbed confession and it'll all be good, right? But Paul's answer to that is, by no means. That's not how grace works. If we talk like this, if we ask this type of question, it's clear that we have a wrong understanding of what grace is. And true believers cannot think this way. By no means. Not at all. Don't even go there. So, naturally you might ask the question, well, if I can't think this way, if I can't do that, why? Why can't I think this way? Why is that a wrong way of thinking? And that's where this theme of this chapter comes into play, that, that we have been set free and the answer, it seems, in Paul's unique way of writing, is all the way down at the end of verse 7. And we'll read that in just a second. Uh, but his conclusion is that we can't think this way because we have been freed from sin. We have been set free from sin. So, why are we free from sin? I still sin. How are we free from sin? How did we become free from sin? I mean, it raises a lot more questions than it does give in terms of the simple answers right away. But Paul answers all of this starting in verse 2, and he continues to explain it through verse 11. So again, follow along with me uh, as I read that. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who, are, who were baptized into Christ Jesus 
were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. With death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. We'll stop there at the end of verse 11. So we have been set free from sin. So let's look at the why and the how. And he gives uh, several reasons for this. But the first thing that he says about being set free from sin is that we have died to sin. What does that mean? We have died to sin. We're all still here. We all still sin. What does that mean? Well, certainly he doesn't mean that we are no longer tempted by sin. We're we're tempted every day, right? Anger still wells up inside of us. Greed and selfishness and envy and jealousy and pride. They're always lurking. The lure of pornography doesn't just disappear. The lure of our own selfish ambitions do not just disappear. We are still tempted. So having died to sin doesn't mean that we're not tempted. While sin sin still has an influence over us, but we'll, we'll look at that in a few verses later, in verses 12 through 14, but it doesn't have a power, a mastery, a control over us. So it doesn't mean that we're not tempted. He also doesn't mean that we're no longer capable of sinning. I wish that were true. Come to my house and ask my family, and they would be more than happy to tell you how sinful they are. I mean, how sinful I am. There are other ways that one could inadequately understand what it means to die to sin. But let me put it simply like this. That we are no longer under the reign or the ruling power of sin. And we've talked about this the last couple weeks. That that there are two ruling kingdoms. There's one side with the reign and the rule of sin with Adam as its representative. And that reign led to death. The other reign, the other rule, the other kingdom is the reign, the rule of grace. And grace brings life. And Jesus is, is the representative of that kingdom. And at the very moment that you and I put our faith in Jesus, We are no longer under the rule of sin. We were transferred from the kingdom of death into the kingdom of light. We were moved to the reign of grace. And so though sin still has an influence over you, it's lost its power to dictate to you. As Timothy Keller puts it, Sin can no longer dictate to you. Though you may obey it, and though the Bible predicts that you will obey it, 
the fact remains that you no longer have to obey it. You have died to it. And it can be dead to you. So, we died to sin. But how? When? And that leads to Paul's very next part in verse 3. Yes, don't you, don't you know this? Don't you know this? Haven't you heard this? Well, let me tell you. And that's where he starts using the verbiage of baptism to explain how and when we died to sin. Starting in verse 3, that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Jesus was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may have new life. So he's using this verbiage of baptism. He, he's not talking about the ordinance or the practice or the ceremony of water baptism. Notice he doesn't use or mention water here at all. He's talking about the, the spiritual reality that baptism represents. The word baptism carries the understanding of being placed into something. It's like we are placed into the water when we do the ceremony of baptism. It carries this understanding of being identified with something. carries this understanding of having our identity changed. When we place our faith in Jesus Christ, at that very moment, we were placed into the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Don't know how that happened. Somehow in God's economy and, and, and God's timeline that's beyond our understanding that at that moment, even though we put our faith in Jesus 2,000 years later, that at that moment we, our old man, our old self, was crucified with him. We were buried with him and we rose. We were identified with him at that moment. Our identity changed. Again, we go back to chapter 5 in this. And to pick up on the fact that Paul stated to believers who were once in union with Adam, that we are now in union with Jesus. And as a result, what was true of him, what is true of him, is true of us. You look at the different parallels in our passage that we just read. It tells us that he died. Death knows, has no master over Jesus. He died to sin. His death, that was meant as the payment for yours and my sin, his death became ours. He died to sin once for all. We died to sin. Our old self was crucified and died with him. Again, we died to sin. But it was his substitution on the cross. Yet, we are identified with that as well. His resurrection, another parallel, is his resurrection gave him life that he lives for God. So we too are united in his resurrection that we could have a new life. That at the time that we put our faith in Jesus, even though it was him who died on the cross, it was him who was buried, it was Jesus who rose again. That we are united with him. Our old self died. We were buried with him and we were raised to new life. 
And that new life is really the third thing of what it means to have been set free from sin is that we have a new life to live for God. Since we died to sin, we need to live that way. It says, count yourself dead to sin. Your translation may word it a little differently. It may say reckon, or it may say consider yourself. But in other words, count yourself dead to sin means live like it's true. Act upon this reality. Don't fall back into an old pattern. Don't allow sin to dictate how you should act. Count yourself as dead. Even though you're still alive walking around and sin is lurking at your back door, count yourself dead to it. Because that's what the truth is. We were studying this earlier this week. We were using the, the analogy of, of a married person, right? You know, especially for us guys, we can recognize the fact that, that there are still people out there that we're attracted to, even though we're married. And even though some of them may come across our path or some of them may show interest in us, that those people are to be considered dead to us because we have chosen a wife. We have chosen a spouse who has ordered our affections toward her. We have chosen somebody else. We've been brought into that new identity, that new relationship, and all others, forsaking all others. They're still around. They're still lurking, but they're dead to us. Because we have chosen a new life, a new reality, a new identity. The temptation doesn't go away. But we live as if those temptations don't have any control over us. So we've been set free from sin. So what does it mean then to be set free? And that's the next point in this, is that believers do not have sin as our master. Read the next couple verses with me. Uh, 12 through 14 says, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. So we have been set free from sin and sin is no longer our master. So there are a few things with that, of really what that means, is that we do not need to let sin have authority over us. As I'm looking back there at the time. I'm going to go through this whole section kind of all at once. So we do not need to let sin have authority. We do not need to choose to sin. We really should be offering ourselves to God's authority. And that we really should be used rather than instruments of wickedness, but to be used as instruments of righteousness. As we already talked about, and as as was referred to in chapter 5, that there are those two kingdoms, those two rulers, those two reigns, that we can fall under. But as people who have been united with Christ, sin is no longer our master. This is where Jesus declared his emancipation proclamation over sin. 
we are free. It may have the ability to influence, but it has no authority. Sin is not our master. And though it was dealt with on the spiritual level, we do not need to let sin reign and rule in our physical body as well. It may try to exert authority over us, but we don't have to give in to it. And though sin often starts in our mind and our hearts, we do not need to offer ourselves to carry out those sinful acts. You know, have a new master. I don't know. It's, it's no, no hidden secret that you know, I, I like to watch movies and I often try and watch them with my kids. And sometimes I say that I use that as my way of discipling my kids as we talk about films. But we just like to watch movies. Um, and there's a relatively recent movie called Emancipation, starring Will Smith. It's on Apple Plus. Has anybody seen that? Okay. Um, it's a good movie. I kind of expected Will Smith to slap somebody, but um, <laughs> not that type of movie. Uh, but it's a true story um, of a slave who escapes and finds his freedom. And there's one very interesting scene in it where there's the, the talk amongst the slave owners that kind of gets down to the level of the slaves in the field where they're saying, you know, I hear that Lincoln freed the slaves. That I, hear, I hear that we're free. Lincoln freed the slaves. Yet some of the slaves in the field, even though they were freed at that t point in time, they either didn't feel like they could because they still had a master that was over them, that was exerting control that they couldn't pull themselves away from, or they were fearful of what might happen had they were just to get up and leave, even though legally they could have. Or they felt comfortable there because even though they were there against their will, that their needs were being taken care of to some degree. And while they might not have felt safe, they felt comfortable there. And so there's the talk about, oh, the slaves have been set free. Lincoln freed the slaves. And Will Smith's characters, are, I'm not staying another day. I'm leaving. I'm escaping. Who's come with me? And people are like, I'm not going. Can't do it. And that's often the way that we are with our sin. That we have been moved from a different master. That we do not have that authority over us anymore. But sometimes we, because we have become so use to the way that we live with our sin. They're like, I, I, I can't change. I know I've been set free. I know that in Jesus I'm free. That's what it says. But I'm just a little too comfortable in this. Or if I were to leave this life of sin, what would that mean in terms of separating myself from my family? Or what would that mean in terms of separating myself from, yeah, I know it's awful, but I'm comfortable here, and what's out there, I don't know. Or if I try and leave this, I'm just going to be sucked back in, and I'm never going to break free of it. We tend to live that way. But we have a choice. Instead of offering ourselves to sin, we can offer ourselves to God. There's no room to excuse our sin. We don't need to let sin have dominion over us. We can't say that we're a victim to our sin because it's been put completely taken care of. Sin is powerless to force us to do anything. 
Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that no temptation is overtaking us except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted, tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so you can endure it, so that you can escape. We have the choice that when we are tempted, he provides the way out. Now, it may not be the way that we expect. You know, I, I, I like to use the example of speeding because I can fall into that a little too often. And I'm convicted of that. But frequently when I'm going over the speed limit, I'm doing that because... I've chosen to do that. I'm running late or I'm disregarding the law. <clears throat> there are times, though, I don't realize it. You know, I'm just kind of steadily have my foot on the gas, and I don't realize that I've gotten it up to a higher speed. Just leave it at that. <laughs> there are times, right? But there's a way of escape. Every few miles, there is a speed limit sign. That's my way of escape to remind me that I do not need to be going 80. I need to be going 65. Did I just say that? I, okay. Or sometimes that way of escape may be the police officer that pulls, you over, pulls me over. And that is the punishment, the escape, that reminder to not do that again so that I don't choose to do that next time. So that now, every time I drive 42 towards Cedarville, I put my, um, you know, my, what is it, my, yeah, my cruise control on so that I'm at 35 all the time because I did not like getting pulled over at that time on others. Like, there is the way to escape. It's up for us to choose to go through that, use the escape or not. And then we offer ourselves to God's authority, not to that. Like, sometimes it's just a matter of choice of how we're going to spend our time or what we're going to do. Are we going to do the right thing? Are we going to do the thing that is hard but honors the Lord? Or are we going to fall back and choose to do a pattern that is not what he wants us to do? Because it's easy or safe or because it's just what I'm used to doing. We can't live in despair over our sin. And we shouldn't be tolerating sin. I'm going to just make a little note here. We need to be careful as we talk about choosing to do right, choosing to offer ourselves to God rather than to offer ourselves to sin. We need to be careful about a legalism or a moralism that somehow says that, that we can earn God's favor by the good deeds that we do or, or by following the law. But at the same time, we can't overlook the moral requirements that come with our union to Christ. Now that you can go on the two opposite extremes. You can be like, well, you know, I don't want to be legalistic, and so, you know, don't tell me that I need to be doing the right thing or that I need to make good choices because now I feel like you're making this some kind of legalistic thing. Anytime somebody challenges me to, to make a better choice, we kind of put up this defensiveness of like, oh, no, I have freedom. The other end is we're like, well, you know, you know, I, I don't want the, too much legalistic or, or, or rules to kind of keep me in check. But then I don't want any rules. But we can't go to either extreme. We can't be legalistic and we can't just use our freedom to keep on sinning. And this is the whole point of what Paul's getting at. 
Legalism says that the way to deal with sin is to just don't sin. Right? Hey, stop that. Don't do that. That's what Jesus was getting at on the Sermon on the Mount, where he says, don't murder. You know, you've heard it say, don't murder, don't commit adultery. But I say to you, if you hate in your heart, you've committed murder already. If you've lusted after another person in your heart, you've committed adultery already. We break the law in our hearts first. And that's enough to make us guilty. So the answer to sin is not don't sin. The answer to sin is grace. When we see, when we realize, when we come to understand that his grace is there freely given to us, that we don't deserve it, that he has moved us from one kingdom into another kingdom, that he has given us a way out so that we do not have to be mastered by our sin, then grace teaches us that we can make better choices. That grace gives us the freedom to love and to obey as an act of worship and not as an act of the enforced law. The third part, and the ironic part in all of this, and in all of this chapter, is that while we have been set free, that at that very same time we have become a slave. Seems ironic, right? You've been set free to become a slave. Verse 18 says, You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. He echoes that and states it a little bit more clearly in verse 22. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. So follow along with me again as I read, uh, starting in verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey? Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. Now I'm using an example from everyday life because of your human limitations. Just as you used to offer yourself as slaves to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, So now, offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness, leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And we have become a slave, but you are either a slave to sin or a slave of God. You know, as Bob Dylan said it, you got to serve somebody. It may be the devil. Or it may be the Lord, but you got to serve somebody. No one is actually free. 
everyone is a slave to something or someone. So what does it mean to be a slave to something? Obviously, as stated in that previous section, if we obey, or we offer, or we present ourselves to do what the other one wants, we're a slave to that. So it means if, if we seek it, if we give something prominent in our life, if we worship it, if we love it, we will either be a slave to sin or a slave of God. And you're a slave to whichever one you're obeying. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, A people remains in slavery until it receives and wants to receive truth and freedom from God alone. We remain in slavery until we receive and we want to receive truth and freedom from God alone. And until a people knows that truth and freedom will lead it into love, and know that the way of love leads to the cross. That we will be truly free as a slave to God. There is true freedom when we recognize that that freedom lies at the cross. That because of what Jesus did there, that we are free to live the life that he's called us to live. That we are free to choose something other than sin. And of course, sin leads to death. You know, uh, 6.23, we were, we were kind of joking as we were studying this, like, well, you know, 6.23 is the, the verse everybody knows in this chapter. We could just focus on that. We actually really could. That's the gospel in one verse. Greg was using that in the class he was teaching for our little kids. That Romans 6.23 is the gospel in a nutshell. That the wage, the thing that we earn from sin the benefit, it says here in this passage, the benefit that we get from sin is only death. Yeah, it, it may be some momentary pleasure or a good thing, but ultimately it leads to death. When you did the things that you were ashamed of, what was that benefit? Yeah, there was death spiritual one for sure. Do certain things. There will certainly be a physical one. Most of us would recognize that a lot of the sins that we've committed have an emotional or relational effect that has scarred us and killed us in some way. The effect of sin is death. But grace transforms us. And there's a sharp comparison between the two rulers. And the one reign leads to death. The other reign leads to righteousness. One means that you are not controlled by righteousness. The other means that you are not controlled by sin. I don't think I can do a sermon without doing a quote from Spurgeon. Spurgeon says, this is how grace works. It enters the soul. It penetrates the heart. Saturates the conscience. It abides in the memory. It affects the affections. It gives understanding to the understanding. And imparts real life to the heart, which is the seed of life. If grace does not make you to differ from your own surroundings... Is it really grace at all? Grace is there to transform us. And that's where he says, 
was that in verse 17? Not verse 17, sorry. That you now obey from the heart. That's the transformation from the inside out. The transformation that comes, comes from the inside out. It's the transformation of a new master. It's a transformation, again, that's reiterated in all these sections of a new life. And hopefully you see that in that pattern of this entire chapter. It's a new life. It's a new life. It's a new life. It's not the old life. And so I want to wrap it up with this. You know, we said that in this section, this is the sanctified life. It's the word sanctification doesn't appear in this at all. So how do we get to that? What does dying to sin, being a slave to God, have to do with the sanctified life? What is the sanctified life? Sanctification is that process of transformation that we just talked about. It's the process where our loves, our desires, our appetites are all reordered and reshaped. For Jesus. It's, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness that leads to holiness. Sanctification is that leading toward holiness. And there's just three things that I want to say quickly as we close about what the sanctified life is. That The sanctified life is still God's gracious work. That transformation to make you and I more like Jesus is God's grace being heaped upon grace. We can't earn it. It's his loving posture toward all people. He doesn't change us to make him like him Because we are any more worthy or good than somebody else. God transforms us because of his mercy. It's his free gift to us. But it's also God's supernatural work. It means that sanctification isn't limited by your personality or your experience or your upbringing. It isn't limited by your spirituality or your Bible knowledge or how well you do in Pastor Gray's class at Cedarville, or it doesn't matter, or your ever-increased morality. If those things aren't tied to a changed heart, it does, none, of, none of those things matter. Sanctification involves that transformation of the human person in the depths of their heart and their soul. And the Holy Spirit is the one who does that. But we are not bystanders in this. We we are not spectators in this process. We choose to obey. We work out our faith, as Paul says. As one writer put it this way, salvation is by faith, but sanctification is by struggle. And then the result of this sanctified life is holiness and obedience and good works and Christ-likeness. In sanctification, God forms his people to resemble his holy character. And it's that holy character that is revealed in Jesus Christ himself. In his love, in his self-sacrifice, in his obedience to the Father. We acquire new habits, new practices, new thoughts, new rightly ordered loves. And to to do the good works that we were created to do, as it says in Ephesians 2.10. This is all a part of the gift of God. 
You know, in chapter 5, the gift of God is mentioned five times, just in a very short section. The gift of God's righteousness given to us who don't deserve it. This is the sanctified life. But you might be looking at all this and you're like, man, I still sin every day. I, this was the hard thing for me as I was putting this together. Like, how can I preach this? Because I still sin all the time. I can't do this. It's not working. It's still a struggle, and a struggle is a struggle. It's hard. Well, guess what? Paul anticipates that too. That's what we're going to be talking about in chapters 7 and 8. So you'll have to come back and hear the rest of it, or read ahead and study it with us. But this is the sanctified life that we've been called to, to live. That because we have been freed from sin, that we can choose to live a life that looks like Jesus. So pray with me. Wow, God, as I, as I look at this again and I hear these words that come out of my mouth and see the words that you've put on the page for us to read and study. God, I'm so humbled and ashamed at times by knowing how often that is not represented by my life. God, I am so thankful, as we all are, that you have given us your free gift of eternal life in Jesus. And that this sanctified life is a process. And that you are working to shape us. You're chipping away at us to make us more like your son. So God, we invite you to continue to chip away. We're thankful for your grace. And we give ourselves to you. In the name of Jesus. Amen.